There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else can heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles, and he will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, no, not one. I asked those individuals to share with you one thing they loved about the Lord, one thing they love about God. And the constant response I got from all of them, if they allow me to say it, is Pastor Justin, you want me just to give you one? Because when you really begin to reflect on it, begin to think about everything that God is, everything that God represents, there's so much to love about God. <sighs> the reason I had that activity, and the reason I want you to think about it is I believe there are times in our lives where we begin to forget the reason why we really love the Lord. We, so I think sometimes we begin to forget the reasons why I trust him, why I care for him, why, why, why I lean on God, that we get so caught up in our lives, caught up in ourselves, caught up in what's going on, caught up in our fear, caught up in things that are happening around us, that sometimes we forget the reasons why, man, I love the Lord. See, that, that's one of the reasons why even when we transition from being in person to being online, it gets difficult because my worship was pictured in a building and now it's not that the church has fallen, it's that the church has moved, but my picture of Jesus has to evolve because I have to remember and grab a hold of why I really love God. Why do you love the Lord? Why do you serve him? Why do you why do you go to church, man? Why do, you, why do you read your Bible? Why do you love them? The answer to that question is what's going to keep you in times when you want to give up on your faith. The answer to that question is going to keep you in times when you don't want to do what God is calling you to do. The answer to that question is what will keep you in the moments when you want to give up on what God is calling you to do. The answer to that question sometimes will remind you the ways that Jesus chased you down when you didn't love him and sure enough didn't love yourself, the answer to that question will keep you when you don't want to do what God is calling you to do. I wonder what would have happened if Jonah would have simply answered that question. I wonder what would have happened if Jonah answered that question when he got to Nineveh. I wonder if we ever would have had chapter 4 after a very powerful chapter three. Jonah arrives in Nineveh. He has some work to do. He doesn't like the work he has to do, but he has some work to do. Chapter three is a very interesting story in scripture. Chapter three is a powerful story in scripture. Chapter three challenges us to get our acts together. There's not a friend why do you love him? Maybe that's the answer and the anecdote to our anxiety, to hold on to our connection back to Jesus when life wants to pull us away. Uh, maybe it's not always life pulling us away when you don't want to be what God has called you to be. That's the story in Jonah chapter 3. Grab your Bibles, turn with me to Jonah chapter 3. <clears throat> I hope this series has been impacting you and um, has arrested you this this uh, this this month, I've been enjoying preaching it and teaching it, and I wanted to look at Jonah in a different light instead of just preaching on the main tenets of Jonah. I wanted to look at Jonah a little bit differently, and I pray that this has had impact for you. We're going to read the entire chapter. It's only ten verses. I think you'll see God and see yourself in it. 
Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Somebody say a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now, Nineveh was an extremely large city, a three-day walk. Notice these numbers. Chapter 1, it was a three-day journey. He was Sorry, he was in the belly of a, Chapter 2, he was in the belly well for three days. Going to Nineveh would have been a three-day journey. City of Nineveh was a three-day walk. I mean, Tarshish was a three-day journey. Nineveh was a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed, In the 40 days, Jonah, Nineveh will be overthrown. In the Hebrew, that's five words. The men of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, put on sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh, by the order of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock, is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, um, both man and beast must be covered in sackcloth, and everyone must call out earnestly to God. Each must turn from his evil ways and from the violence he is doing. Who knows, God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning passion so that we will not perish. Then God saw their actions. They had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do to them. And he, God, did not do it. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up, go to Nineveh and preach the sermon. I tell you, Jonah got up and went according to the Lord's demand. It was a three-day walk. He set out and proclaimed. It'll be overturned. The people believed in God. The word of God for the people of God. The people said, thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, in the places where Jonah, forgive us. In the places where we can be what Jonah wasn't, enliven us, awaken us to the burning passion and desire you have for us, that we might rejoice in the places you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whew. So Jonah finally made it to Nineveh. Let's, let's walk through the story. Let me give you some principles, and then we'll go on and Enjoy the rest of our Sundays. Jonah has been spit up from the whale. The whale has landed Jonah somewhere near the city of Nineveh. We believe about a day's journey away from Nineveh. The Bible says Jonah lands away from Nineveh and he walks to Nineveh. And the text says that God came to Jonah a second time. Let me pause there and say this just very quickly to every single one of us. It's something you've heard before, but I want to remind you, I thank God for the second time. I do. I thank God for the times when I said no to God the first time and he gave me a chance to say yes. And the same word that he gave me the first time, God gave me a second time. I thank God for a second time. I thank God for the times that he didn't give up on me when I gave up on him. I thank God for a second time. And a whole bunch of us are living into seasons of our lives because God gave you a second time. He came to you a second time. He called you a second time. He came and cra- uh, grabbed a hold of you a second time. And God came to Jonah a second time. We came to Jonah a second time. The text says that Jonah leaves and he goes over to Nineveh to preach a sermon to give them the word of God. And the word of God that God Jonah was commanded to give them was a five word Hebrew sermon that God was going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. And Jonah gives them that sermon. Now notice the things that Jonah doesn't, does not give them in that sermon. He doesn't give them the opportunity to repent. He doesn't give them the opportunity of reconciliation. He doesn't give them the opportunity of coming back closer to God. He just tells them that God is going to destroy destroy the city of Nineveh. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Nineveh itself, the text says, was a three days journey. It was a three days walk. It was a massive city. So here's what we believe Jonah did. Jonah came into Nineveh. He found a marketplace, a place where they were sinning, a place where they were against God, a place where they were just absolutely corrupt. And Jonah decided that he was going to preach the word of God to the people of Nineveh. God is going to destroy the city in 40 days. 40 being a representation of a complete turnaround from someone that's going against the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. We see that all throughout Hebraic literature. And so now Jonah comes into this Gentile community of Nineveh and tells them, if you want to be connected back to God, act like Hebrews. Jonah was a Hebrew. And so Jonah says, act like Hebrews. And that is 40 days. God is going to turn the city over its head and he's going to destroy the city. And the people said, we're going to do what Hebrews did. And that was, they proclaimed a fast, grabbed sackcloth, grabbed ashes, and they turned their hearts back to God. 
Now, this shows us a couple things about Jonah. Remember the book of Jonah, we don't know if it was really a true story, which is why we see some extremes in the book of Jonah. Remember, it was Jonah who heard the word of God, went completely against God, and didn't just not go to Nineveh. I mean, he went completely against it. They throw him over a a ship. He gets into the water. He's into the bottom of the water. Chapter 2 says he's in the bottom of the water, and a whale swallows him. A whale swallows Jonah. I mean, the extremes in this text. Then Jonah ends up jumping out of the, gets out of, spit up out of the whale because of one prayer. One prayer got him out of a whale. He gets on to dry land and goes into a city, preaches one sermon, and the whole city wants to figure out how they can turn their hearts back to God. Jonah's story is about these extremes that happen in Scripture. So what's the point of all of this? Why is chapter 3 important? Here's what chapter 3 shows us before I get to principles about mental wellness and well-being. Jonah shows us in chapter 3 the power of preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jonah shows us. Jonah chapter 3 shows us that it's not about messengers, it's about the message. And that the challenge that God has to give to all of us is to ensure that in every situation and place that God sends you, you tell somebody about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's nothing else you get from Jonah chapter 3, it's this. There's power in the word of God. And there's something powerful when we stop getting so consumed with the messenger. Because remember, Jonah is preaching to the people of Nineveh out of arrogance. He's preaching to the people of Nineveh in his pride. He's preaching to people he doesn't like. He's preaching to people he hopes don't turn their heart back to God. He's preaching to people he doesn't want to be around. But here's the good news. God uses some crazy messengers to get his crazy story so that all of us can live a crazy life that's connected to a God that we can't see to do things that you can see. Y'all, there's something powerful about the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's nothing I can give you today, baby, I want to tell you one thing. Keep on reading that story. There's something powerful about this book. You know, there's a whole lot of things that could go wrong in our lives, but I thank God we still got this book, that this book is still a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This book still brings clarity. This book still opens eyes, and despite what anything happens in our lives in spite of the messengers that come. I thank God for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that God is getting us to a point, y'all church, where I believe that for it's a call for the local church. It's a call for us, but I want to challenge even those of you who are not a part of our church or watching our live stream. It's a call for us to stay in this book. I believe this is a season of flat-footed gospel preaching that the word of God still holds every single promise that God has ever given. And I don't care what translation you read, but be in this book. I don't care what scriptures you are reading, but be in this book and don't convolute scripture for your benefit benefit, but read it according to the word of God. And Jonah gets up and shows us that even when my heart is hardened, God will still use a prophet to get the word of God through. I thank God for the word of God. Jonah gets up and he preaches a sermon. He tells them in 40 days, God's going to turn Nineveh on his head. God is going to bring disaster to Nineveh. It's a five word Hebrew sermon. It's a five-worded sermon that Jonah gives them, and he doesn't give them opportunities to change, doesn't give them opportunities to move over. And immediately, church, they turn their hearts to God. The king issues a decree. Here's what I want to show you in this text, too, that Jonah doesn't do. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah decides to preach this sermon, but he doesn't go to the king. Prophets had the authority. Prophets, being the people they were, they didn't have the authority. Sorry, they grabbed the authority because God gave them the authority to go to the kings and tell the kings what to do. The king never met Jonah, but the word of God was so powerful that it got to the king. Because I want to show you something, that when you, are, when you are following after the footsteps of God, when you are doing exactly what God told you to do, everything will bow at the word of God. See, it's never the pastor or the prophet or the teacher that has the authority. It's the word of God that's coming out of the prophet, pastor, and preacher. It's the word of God that comes out of all of you. And every prophet is not standing on a Sunday morning. There are prophets who are watching this live stream sitting in your living room. There are prophets who are watching this live stream sitting in your kitchen because prophets are the ones that see the needs in communities and will follow after God even if they don't always want to do what God is calling them to do because they know if If I ever were to open up my mouth, the word of God is going to come out. And I'm talking to folk in the building. The healing this nation needs is going to come when you open up your mouth. The movement this country needs is going to open when you open up your mouth. The change your family needs is going to come when you open up your mouth. The way we'll see things turn around is going to come when you open up your mouth. Because you are so equipped, even with hardened hearts, to do things that eyes have never seen and ears have never heard. 
And Jonah walks into the city. I hope y'all hear, hear me today. He walks into the city and he's equipped with the gospel. You know, I could go in a whole bunch of ways, and I'm going to get to some life application in a moment. But y'all, you've got to be equipped with this gospel. And I don't mean to sound fire and brimstone, but y'all, this is a call back to the gospel. There's something powerful about people who are memorizing and holding on to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's what it shows me. Can I show you this? Jonah's heart was so hardened to the people in Nineveh that he didn't want to see them reconciled. Watch this. That he kept some stuff out of the sermon that God gave him. He didn't offer them reconciliation. He didn't offer them repentance. But let me tell you something. They said, we want God so bad that all we know is if I give my life over to him, God is faithful and just because God will use you in spite of you. I wish y'all. See, there's some parents ought to be thanking God that God used you in spite of you. There's some loved ones who ought to be thanking God that God used you in spite of you. There's some friends who ought to be thanking God that God used you in spite of you. That I thank God that even when I don't want to preach his word, it's like a fire inside of me. Even when I don't want to pray, his word wakes me up. Even when I want to give up, his word still compels me and that people will still see God even when I don't want to give it to them. Jonah gets up and Jonah gives them one sermon. And the whole community is turned on its head. So what's the problem, Pastor Justin? Here's the issue of Jonah chapter 3, the place where I want to talk about our own mental well-being. Jonah really didn't want to go. We know this. Chapter 1, Jonah gets onto a boat. He goes the exact opposite direction. Chapter 2, he's sitting in the belly of a whale. He prays a prayer. God spits him out and says, yes, I forgive you. Go do this. Jonah gets there, y'all. He doesn't wait to give them opportunities for repentance. He doesn't wait for opportunities to engage with them, to grow them, so they can be everything God's called them to be. Jonah's rushing this because he wants to get it over. Why? Because he got upset the people started acting like Hebrews. Y'all are Gentiles. Who do you think you are trying to be Hebrews? His arrogance, his assumptions, his pride, his his lack of empathy caused him To have the title prophet, but not live a life of a prophet. So he preaches a sermon and says, God, you better be pleased with me. He preaches a sermon and says, God, you better just work because I'm not going to be the one to be your hands and feet. Why? Here's why. Here's two words I want to give you today that explain the story of Jonah. It's, It's Jonah's geography versus his eschatology. Jonah, remember, let's talk about geography. Remember, Jonah didn't really want to go to Nineveh in the first place, right? You remember this, right? Jonah really wanted to go anywhere, but he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He's gone to school for being a prophet. He gets up, gets on a boat, has the money to get to Tarshish. That's way farther away than Nineveh. Gets onto a boat, heads towards Tarshish, and on the way to Tarshish, God sends a storm. Jonah really didn't want to go to Nineveh. Why? Because there was a dream in Tarshish that as a prophet he wanted to grab a hold of. We talked about this the first week. That Jonah saw the dreams, the missions, the visions, and the goals that are in in Tarshish. So why in the world, if I have the money to get to Tarshish, would I go to Nineveh? Because geography speaks to the places where God has you. And some of us, under the sound of my voice, you don't like the place where God has you. And like Jonah, you're just like Jonah. You've been faithful to God, and when your faithfulness to God, God finally spits you out of the will, and you're thinking when God spits you out, he's going to send you to Tarshish, and the word of God came to you a second time. No, Jonah, your assignment's to go to Nineveh. but here's why. As bad as you want what's in Tarshish, I've equipped you to make Nineveh become a new Tarshish. I've equipped you with the dreams inside of you that when you get to Nineveh, Nineveh is, not, is ready for you to come in and till the land, that I know you don't like Nineveh, Jonah, but you have been equipped, Jonah, because I've given you the space to dream about Tarshish that you can make Nineveh into exactly what I need Nineveh to be. Uh, Jonah saw Tarshish as Tarshish represents our dreams, our goals, our, our passions, all the things that the world tells us we need to have. And Nineveh represents action plans. Tarshish says, this is what everything I can become. And Nineveh says, but this is the place you're going to do it. Tarshish is somebody else's marriage that you look at at the conference after you go to it and they tell you if you do these five things have this much stuff make this many babies make this much money and then now God says here's the action plan and oops you can't have children or you 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 know you can't have children you're not in a relationship you're 40 years old now all of a sudden what am I going to do because I don't like where I'm at 
Because Tarshish looks like this, but you're calling me to create a new Nineveh. Nineveh is looking at somebody else's business that got started, and they made millions in their first five years, and you're over here contemplating whether or not you're going to get paid this month, because now i got to have an action plan in Nineveh. Tarshish says, I graduated from college, I get a job, and that's what somebody told me to do on a Facebook ad, but Nineveh is the place I actually have to get up and go to work. Tarshish represents dreams we haven't seen. Nineveh represents the places where God can make dreams come true. Tarshish represents the places of visions and goals and dreams and vision planning and plans and stuff. But, but Nineveh shows you the place where you got to sit down, open up your computer, begin to write the book, begin to write the blog, begin to record the podcast, begin to talk to your children. Because Nineveh, Tarshish represents the dreams that God allows you to dream. Nineveh represents the place where God loves you enough to make those dreams become a reality. And how many times, church, have we gotten to Nineveh and gotten frustrated with God because it's not Tarshish when God says watch this I've equipped you with everything inside of you to make a Nineveh better than the Tarshish you dreamt of that I've given everything to you church so that when you get to Nineveh you have the authority to make Nineveh become bigger than Tarshish I'm talking to folk under the, my, the sound of my voice you're so consumed with what your friend from high school did that God said listen I put so much inside of you that your friend from high school is going to be looking at you for how to make it work. You're so consumed with how your friends in school or your friends from college or your friends around you are doing when God says quit comparing your child to somebody else's child and walk with them and talk with them. Quit comparing your job to somebody else's job and walk onto your job because I positioned you in Nineveh because you have everything you need to make Nineveh better than anything Tarshish could ever dream of becoming. God's ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. His, his future is not the future we always want. But baby, I can make Nineveh better than Tarshish ever thought they could become. But the challenge of Nineveh is my geography. I don't always like where God calls me. I don't always like what God calls me to do. And the challenge, the issue that comes with our mental well-being and the struggles with our minds is that when we get to these places, that's where anxiety and insecurity and frustration come in because you begin to preach the gospel and no one listens. You begin to preach the gospel and people respond in ways that you don't like them responding. You begin to preach the gospel and people begin to do things. You begin to work your business and it doesn't grow as fast. You begin to do things that God is calling you to do and it doesn't go as fast as you assume it does because you're working in Nineveh. But I want to challenge you. Be comfortable that God has equipped you to handle places nobody else wants to go to because he's using you to pave the way and pave the path for legacy leaving in your life. Geography. And on the other side of this geography church was eschatology. Eschatology speaks about the vision that God has for the future. So Jonah was in a place he didn't want to be, doing something he didn't want to do. The last thing Jonah wanted to see was the people of Nineveh turn their hearts over to God. I don't want to see them do that because I don't I'm a Hebrew, they're Gentiles. I don't want to see them turn their hearts over to God. And God gives them a word that says disaster. So Jonah's comfortable telling them about disaster. He's not comfortable telling them about reconciliation. He's comfortable about telling them what, what's wrong with them, but he's not comfortable giving them any way to be repentant and turn their hearts back to God. Seschatology, the vision that he had for them, was demise, was disaster was ruin, was frustration, and it was pain. Jonah was comfortable telling them everything that was wrong with them, and Jonah shows up in Nineveh and gives them this sermon because the vision of God that God would have had for them to be connected back to him, Jonah didn't like. It's just you and me. What don't you like about what God is calling you to do? No, for real, it's just you and me on your couch. It's just you and me. Nobody else is listening. Because can I be honest with you? There are times that I don't like what God tells me to do. Quiet as it's kept. There are times I want to tell God, take that to somebody else. Send somebody else to Nineveh. Tell somebody else to preach that sermon. Because the last thing I want to do is be responsible to touch people I don't want to touch to minister to people I don't want to minister to. Have you ever been there? It's just you and me. When God's vision doesn't match the vision you had for your life, when God calls you to do something that, frankly, you can't stand that God called you to do that, 
Jonah is sitting in the midst of these two polarities. He doesn't like where God called him. He doesn't like the sermon that God called him to preach. And what Jonah decided to do in this moment was he was lazy with what God told him to do. I'm going to go and say it, and I'm going to watch them be destroyed. In chapter 4, it tells us he got frustrated to a point where he wanted to die because they turned their hearts back to God. And it makes me wonder, what if Jonah went into Nineveh with a heart that was turned towards God, a heart that was expectant that God was going to be God, a heart that said, God, do your work, not just I'm going to just tell people what they need to do. Because as we sit in these two polarities in our lives, what makes us begin to think that God isn't for us or God is against us is because we don't like where we are and we don't like what God is doing. So we sit and teeter on the process and the scales of thriving and coping. So then we begin to get to a place where now I'm thriving if they fail. I'm coping if, they, if, if I'm thriving if one thing happens. I'm coping if something else happens. And we sit and teeter on the teeter of thriving and coping instead of desiring to live a life fully thriving, connected back to God. Jonah meanders into Nineveh, preaches this sermon, and is frustrated that the sermon works. Is frustrated that his gift is real. Is frustrated that God does what God does. Because Jonah expected and wanted God to do things the way that Jonah wanted God to do things to make him feel good about being a Hebrew instead of him being excited that God is growing the kingdom. Maybe our problem with God is that we have a problem with ourselves. Maybe our problem with God is that we haven't had a chance and intentionally sat down and confronted our assumptions. Maybe our issue with our future and with God's vision for us and where the Lord has us is that we haven't sat down and adequately confronted our own arrogance. And if we're going to be well in our minds, I want to help you rewire your brain. There are some people and some things that you don't like. There are some people and some things that you cannot stand. Let's confront them before we try to pull people away from Jesus because they are what you can't stand. Because quiet as it's kept, church, God is going to do great work through all of us, even to people you don't like. Jonah rushes the preaching. Jonah rushes the ministry. Jonah rushes the work. Jonah doesn't confront people in power. Jonah doesn't do any of those things simply because Jonah did not want to see God be God to those people. So get your act together. Let us not get so consumed in our judgment or our our, our, our assumptions about other people that we forget the opportunity that God uses to get his word through us to other people. Think about your job. Who are the people on your job you refuse to talk to even as we're in social distancing? Because you're hoping, I mean, you don't want to talk about it, but I'm the one to say it. You're hoping when we come back, they don't have a job. You don't want to say it, but you're thinking about it. Who are the individuals that you're, you're scrolling through Facebook hoping that something just doesn't go well for them? What are the situations that you're hoping things just don't go well for? And I wonder what it would look like if we began to hope the best for those and hope the best for our own lives. Hope that God changes and challenges our own heart. Hope that God removes the malice from our own heart. Hopes that God takes the comparison out of our own heart. Hopes that God takes the time that we've spent to hate others and demise others out of our own heart so that God gives us a word the second time and we're faithful to preach the entire gospel and then we get excited when they turn their hearts back to God. Let's fall in love with our gifts. So that when God calls us to a place, church, I'm not consumed if some, with somebody else. I'm consumed so much with what God says and is calling me to be and do. So what two principles can I give you today to get your act together, to re- rewire your brain, to be so focused on God's vision for you that you're not consumed with somebody else's response? Can I give you two things? Number one, don't let measurements become idols. Don't let measurements become idols. Jonah was consumed with the people and what their response was. 
And so he decided to make sure that he was going throughout the land and he had expectations that the people would sit there and God would destroy them. And the measurement that he had was that God was going to do something because I hate them. And if God spit me up out of this, wa- out of this well after I praised him, that God must do what I want God to do. And so I'm going to go tell this sermon and tell them God's going to bring disaster. And the measurement of my success is that God is going to bring disaster. And we forget at times, church, that God's measurements are not always our measurements. There's a necessity to understand numbers. To all of your business owner, to every leader, there's a necessity to know your numbers. There's a necessity to be sure that things are clear. There's a necessity to be clear that things are to the point that you know what's going on in and out of your business, what's going on in and out of your home. There's a necessity to have numbers. Even in our own church, every number has a name. Every name has a story. We don't just give. There's a story behind every dollar that comes into the church. Numbers are important, but numbers, church, cannot be the tell-all, end-all of who you are. I refuse to believe that when I get to heaven, God's going to check how much I have in savings. I need a savings account. I need to have a job. But I refuse to think that God's going to get to heaven. I'm going to get to heaven and God's going to check my resume. I I, I refuse. I, I don't think God cares what school I went to, how much money I make, how many people I know, how many things I'm doing. God wants to see, did you heal the, did you, did you, did you heal the sick? Did you give sight to the blind? Did you give people access to who the love of Jesus Christ was? And measurements, church, cannot be an idol. Jonah goes and preaches and he's expecting God to do things the way that Jonah wanted God to do things. And measurements became an idol. He began to worship disaster. What are you worshiping? What are the idols in your life that if God were to call you to Nineveh, your heart is not purged of? That you would go into Nineveh and heap disaster without reconciliation? And I'm not trying to beat you up, but I I want you to be well enough so that you can see every person the way that Jesus sees people. I want you to be well enough so you can see yourself the way that Jesus sees you. What are the, the idols, the measurements in your life? You know, the way that you compare. You know, here's what preachers do. And preachers that are watching me and pastors that are watching me. Here's what we do. How many you running, doc? How many folk you got, doc? What you raising, doc? And it goes on with businesses too. How many... How many, how many people you had coming to your, your business this month? How, many, how much money did you make? Ah, oh, man, we had the best month we've ever had. <laughs> what? Man, my children, you do it with your children. What? My child plays soccer and basketball. No, my soccer, my, 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 my daughter is an artist and my daughter can sing. Oh, no, my daughter had a 4.4. That's possible? Yes, a 4.8. My daughter had a 6.3. Because measurements become our idol. And that we live life and even give tests to children to, build, to, to test their competency because we want to keep giving them measurements instead of giving anyone the flexibility to just be themselves and know that as you are who God has called you to be, God will always reward those who diligently seek them. Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, if you want, if you want approval from people, then that's your reward. If you want approval from me, then that can be your reward. So don't always think there's a need to prove yourself in public because there's something you're doing private. Jonah got so consumed with measurements that measurements became his idol. Church, I want to challenge you. Don't let the measurements of success become an idol for you, but let what go- your obedience be the one thing that gets you connected back to God. Secondly and finally, I want to challenge you to step back and look. Step back and look. I believe that if Jonah would have gotten into Nineveh, even with a hardened heart, and would have taken the time, church, to step back and look at the city and see the king giving a decree, see the people that are going to worship and giving their lives over to Christ, see the people who are rejoicing in everything that God's telling them to be, see the individuals who are listening to the glory of God, and to see the people who are doing the work of God, who are trying. I think Jonah with a better heart, would have responded differently. We would tell their story differently. The amazing thing and the crazy thing about Jonah's story is that he was so tunnel vision on his own assumptions and accusations that Jonah couldn't step back and see what God was doing. Can I challenge something to help all of us become mentally well and spiritually well? There are times, church, where you need to just take a step back and widen your perspective and see things the way that God sees them. 
We get so caught up in tunnel vision where I got I to accomplish this, I got to finish this, I have to go here, I have to accomplish this, I have to know this person, I have to sleep with this person, I have to make this, I have to do this, I have to create this, I have to go here, I have to make this amount of money, I got to get married by this age, I got to have children by this age, I got to do this by this age, and if I don't, I'm going to be a failure in whose eyes, I don't know, but my own eyes, and I'm telling myself everything's going to be terrible, I'm anxious, I'm insecure, now I'm depressed, I want to lose my life, I want to hurt somebody else's life, I want to cut somebody's tires, I want to lose my mind, I got to go to church, but my church ain't do. I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, my job won't do this for me. And now, because I'm so tunnel vision focused, I want to challenge you to step back and see. Because can I tell you something about every single person on the side of my voice? The fact that you have Wi-Fi to watch a service, the fact that you have a church to go to, and you're not persecuted for being in church, the fact that you have life today is something to give God glory for. You, you know, I wonder what it would be like for us if we didn't stay so tunnel vision focused on paying off all of our debt that we could rejoice that you paid off one credit card. I know you have student loans, but can you rejoice that you got a degree? I know your marriage ain't perfect, but can you rejoice that a man or a woman who finds a spouse is a good thing? Can, I, I, I know things aren't perfect for you in college, but can you rejoice that you got a college to go to? I I know everything's not perfect with your children, but can you rejoice that you got kids? Because when I widen my perspective, I begin to see things the way that God sees things. No, I'm working multiple jobs, but baby, I got a job. You no, know, I ain't got a whole lot of friends, but baby, I got some loved ones that call on me. No, everything is not perfect, but when I open up my eyes and widen my perspective, I can see things the way that God sees them, and I can rejoice that baby God has made a way in my life. God has opened doors in my life. God has woke me up this morning. God has started me on my way. No baby I ain't got a mansion but I got this apartment and I thank God for an apartment. No I ain't got a wooden oven but I thank God for this electric stove. No I ain't got everything and you ain't got to dig it to do it but you can love what you dig. Am I talking to anybody in the building who can thank God that for the stuff that you have and I wonder what it would be like for us to open up our vision we i've been wanting to do that myself i get so consumed with what isn't going well that i lose sight of what is going well jonah was so tunnel vision focused on his expectations and his conclusions that he missed the picture of what god had going on in nineveh folk were fasting folk were praying Folk were giving their life over to God. Folk were trusting God. Folk were trying to figure out what it meant to be close to God because of Jonah's sermon. Can I, can I give you this? Can I give you this principle? Stop being so consumed with digging wells that you take a moment to step back and see what you've dug. That's so good. I said stop being so consumed with digging wells that you step back I am blessed and highly favored. I am bold and confident. I'm a child of the king. Ooh, baby. Do you see how good I look in this mirror? Because God made me look like him. Ooh, ooh, baby. I, hey, I didn't, hey, yes, I've gained some weight, but I, I wear these wools. I, ooh, baby, I, I ain't got everything together, but ooh, yeah, you know what? God has smiled on me that when you step back and see how blessed you are, you don't get so consumed with what's not going well in your life because you can celebrate what the Lord is doing in your life. And I wish I had about four, five, six, seven, eight, nine folk on YouTube who can throw an emoji in this section and thank God that God has smiled and done something for you. I'm going to wait for y'all to throw these in this section real quick because I want y'all to celebrate what God has done, how God has made a way. I'm looking for some folk on Facebook who can thank God right now for every single thing he's done in your life that when you step back and see what God has done, you can see how far he's brought you and that you are are not done yet. Jonah, whoo, man, if you ever would have paused and seen the authority that God has trusted you with, if you ever were to pause and see the wisdom that God has given you, you could have been there to rejoice 
when God turned a whole community around because he gave you a chance a second time. Church, some of you listening to me under the sound of my voice are here and living because God gave you second chances. You may, you may, and for you, I'm not even getting to depression and suicide this week, but going back to chapter two, there were times where your prayer life got so stagnant, your prayer life was done for, but God gave you another chance. You know what I, what I can't stand sometimes? This is just me. I, when God speaks a word and somebody says, I'll pray about it. You know, I, like someone, someone lay hands on you. I'm talking to a couple of y'all. I'm not going to call your names out. But when God says something to you and you've been praying about it and God uses somebody to give revelation and your first response is to pray about it. Can I tell you what God is doing even in the midst of this quarantine? And the word of God is coming to you a second time. Trust me. The word of God is coming to you a second time. I know you don't like where you got, you're called to. I know you don't like who you're called to. I know you don't like the vision I have on your life. I know it. But let me tell you something. That Tarshish you're dreaming about, you are able to make that a reality in Nineveh. I'm talking to entrepreneurs on here. And Ronnie, I've been especially praying for you. I'm talking to entrepreneurs on here. You are able in any place you go to bring the vision that God has put in your head to past, even in places like Nineveh. But he just wants your heart. I'm talking to the three of you on this, on this other side of my screen. I could start calling names out. But two of them are deacons who God has called into ministry. Active ministry. And he's coming to you a second time. I'm talking to the few of you that are listening here as well, and I'll go, how many is it, God? I see 13 and I see 18. I see 13 women and I see 18 men over the course of our services today. And God is coming to you and challenging you on ministry to places in your journal that you wrote down. I see for our women seven days ago and for our men eight days ago. I see God bringing to fulfillment and God bringing to to fruition the very things you're praying about and he's coming to you in this moment a second time and he's telling you I didn't give up on you when you gave up on you I didn't stop working when you stopped working as a matter of fact there's great things that will happen even in Nineveh who are the people that you don't want to do ministry with who are the co-workers that you cannot work with Maybe this moment for you, instead of you getting angry about it, getting anxious about it, calling yourself a failure because of it, or using your pride to wield power, maybe this is a moment for you to pause, step back, evaluate where God has you, evaluate what God is saying to you, rejoice in what you have so that you can move into the moments with a posture of gratitude and joy and not move into those postures of the attitude of arrogance. The word of God came to Jonah a second time. The word of God is coming to you a second time. This time I want you to go with a clear head, a clean heart, and clean hands. I told you earlier in your journal to live a space open for the Lord to speak to you. And I want to talk to you. Who are the people that God is calling you to? What are the things that God is calling you to do? What is the vision that God is calling you to fulfill? What are the scriptures that God is calling you to read? What are the opportunities that God is calling you to take advantage of? What are the difficult conversations that you need to have this week? I see two marriages in my head that God is calling you to have some fun dinners this week. To sit down and let the word of the Lord come a second time. You can't give up here. You can't die here. 
and I'd rather remove the arrogance, the pride, and the assumptions from you so you can rejoice in the calling on your life than letting those things stay stagnant in you that you run away from what God is calling you to be and do. May God arrest you today so that you can rejoice in where God is taking you. I'm teaching my son to use the potty, and I love it so much. He said something to me once. He's doing number one, now he's doing number two, and the day he started doing number two, I remember he, he had been practicing, he'd been going into the bathroom and shutting the door and then using the bathroom and then calling us and saying he has to go after he already did it because he was scared of sitting down and losing control. He was scared of sitting down and losing control. And so the day that he was going to do it, my son ran into the living room. He said, Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy, I have to go number two. And we were like, oh, okay. So we thought it was going to be this big hubbub. He wasn't going to do it. He ran into the bathroom and he said, I'm scared. I'm scared, I'm scared, I scared, I scared, I scared, I scared, I scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. And he sat down and just kept saying, I'm scared. He said, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. And y'all, and we sat there, held Cam's hands and said, don't worry about it. Mommy and daddy are right here. There's nothing to be scared of. And after he used it, I'm going to tell you what he did, y'all. He ran around butt naked, butt naked. He's a baby, so I guess it's cute. He ran around that apartment the whole day and said, I'm not scared anymore. He said, I'm not scared anymore. I'm not scared anymore. I'm not scared anymore. And then Courtney looked at him and said, he ain't scared of none. He ain't scared of you either, right? And just, I, he said, I'm not scared anymore. Why? Because he confronted his fear, but he needed his father and mother. Maybe the only thing you need right now, church, is mommy and daddy to hold, daddy to hold your hand or God the mother to hold your hand while you scream, I'm scared. I don't want to start the business. I'm scared. I don't want to go to college. I'm scared. I don't want to finish school. I'm scared. I don't want to go here. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. And the father looks at you and says, don't worry about it because I'm creating a testimony in you where you can say, I'm not scared anymore. Maybe you're here today. You don't have a church home. And you're going around life saying, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared of life. I'm scared of what will happen if I die. I'm scared of what will happen when I go on. I came to tell you right now, God is coming to you right where you are and says, there's nothing you need to be afraid of. There's nothing you need to be worried about. It's God the Father is walking right next to you saying, there's nothing to be worried about. If that's you, would you pray this prayer with me? It's called the prayer of salvation. If you want to accept Jesus to your heart, will you pray this prayer with me? Just simply say, God, I come. In Jesus' name, I confess I'm a sinner. I admit that I need you. I believe that you were God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I will demonstrate that by giving my life over to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. What you just did, you just prayed the prayer of salvation. Church, can you do me a favor and give it up for every single person who prayed that prayer for the very first time and gave their life over to Christ? If you're here and you also, you're looking to make this church your home or you want to give your life over to Christ, do us a favor. There's a link that's coming up in the chat. Can you click there and just give us some information about you so we can connect with you and follow up with you so that we can celebrate the decision that you're making for the Lord Jesus Christ? Church, I want to tell you, since we've been in the midst of this social distancing and quarantine, we've grown by three and two for baptism. I believe the Lord deserves some prayer. I believe the Lord deserves some praise. Can we give it up for every single person who's trusting God in this season of church, in this season of their life? Listen, we're going to get ready to go, and uh, my wife's going to come back on, and she's going to uh, tell you guys some things that are going on with the church. We're going to have a promo video for Children's Church. Um, I'm, I'm praying the best for all of you, and I'm praying that this week God purges some things from you so that you may be everything that God is calling you to be. May God awaken things and dreams and passions and goals inside of you so you can own the future that's on your life. I love every single one of you. May God bless and keep you is my prayer.